um, butcher block tables that we actually made. We cut the um, steel pipe for the frames and then milled down and um, oiled the tabletop so that they're super durable, depending on what types of projects people are wanting to do with them. And then we have these robo reels hanging throughout the space of some of those big orange balls um, with electricity. So we don't have a lot of outlets along the walls or the floors like most buildings that were built in the 60s and 70s. Um, and it's really expensive to do that. So we just dropped it from the ceiling. Um, but you can see over here, this is our main entrance to the library itself. So everybody comes through these gates. Um, we've got dogs today for another library programming with therapy dogs. Then we've got our um, Einstein bagels coffee shop right over here. Um, and then people just kind of follow this big gray swoop into the fab lab itself. Um, so most of our activity happens in this back corner um over here so this is kind of where our staff congregate <laughs> hello staff <laughs> um and uh so over in this little corner is where we have our uh all of our 3d printers so this is a rack they built to house um our poly printers which are the most popular machines that we have we've also got a uprint machine um, which is cost prohibitive for a lot of people because of the proprietary filament and then we've got um, a printer bot over there and um, that's just not quite as popular but for our space we provide all of the abs filament if anybody wanted to bring in pla to use the printer bots over here they could bring in uh, or PLA or any other kind. We've got a bring your own filament sign so they can choose from some pre-approved um, brands and types of filament to use. But other than that, we um, have on stock what they need and we just charge five cents a gram for the regular ABS and 15 cents a gram for the Ninja Flex um, that we do on this last printer down here. Um, so this is where the bulk of the activity is still 3D printing. We have a lot of different types of equipment, but um, 3D printing is still the most popular. Second to that would be laser cutting. So we've got these two, our epilogue helix laser cutter, and then the boss. When we first opened, we just had the epilogue. Um, and then it was so popular and we always had such a long wait list for it that when we were expanding the space, we got the boss um, so that we could pass materials through these side hatches here. Um, and it's been popular and well used too. It's kind of a clunky machine. We probably wouldn't buy it again if we had the option to change something and get something different, but it works, it does its thing. Um, and then this back corner over here is our printmaking area. We're still shuffling things around, um, but we've got vinyl cutting. So um, this is our vinyl cutter. We've just got a Roland, which is standard for a lot of people. We also have a Cameo cutter. Um, so if the Roland is in use, or even if the uh, laser cutters are used a lot in use, a lot of times people will just be wanting to cut cardstock or a small piece of vinyl, so they can do that with the Cameo. And then we can use that when we do outreach as well. So sometimes we'll go to public libraries or K-12 schools or other outreach events, and we can bring that in my car a lot more easily than we can bring that guy. Um, but we've got regular vinyl and heat transfer vinyl. Um, the heat press, this guy over here, we just got last fall. So we at first we had added the heat transfer vinyl, but not the heat press. People were just using an iron. Um, but this guy obviously allows for a much more even distribution of heat, but then it also comes with attachments so that you can do mugs and you can do hats. Um, so we were able to get that because of um, award dollars that went to faculty who recently received tenure or promotion. They have a stipend that they can put towards library resources. And um, the past couple of years, we've tried to emphasize that while they're still welcome to put those funds towards uh, a book or a journal or a traditional library resource, they could also contribute towards buying a piece of fab lab equipment. So we had three professors who put their money towards us and we combined those to get the, the heat press, which has been super popular. Um, and then we also have a screen press here, which we built in-house um, and allows folks to do screen printing of shirts and bags and all kinds of things. Um, so we built this in our shop room and it's also been super popular. 
we've seen a little bit of a decrease in the screen printers use since we got the heat press just because this process is so much faster and a lot of times people are doing fairly simple blocky designs with just a few colors um, which works perfectly well for the the heat press as well um, can y'all still hear me okay okay good um, and then the other things we have back here, we are low tech, we've got paper making, so that's the shredder and the blender. Uh, and then we've got this paper press over here. And so here's some examples drawing that people didn't press out, but they'll experiment with blending different um, colors of paper or adding in seeds or flowers or leaves and things like that. But um, we've done a lot of work to try and integrate the arts. When we first opened, we had a lot of STEM technologies, or maybe not necessarily STEM technologies, but tools that a lot of the science and engineering majors would be would gravitate more towards, and not necessarily our arts and humanities students. So we tried to be intentional about bringing in more equipment that emphasized and highlighted the arts and humanities. Um, so we've had a history of the book class who has worked with us for um, the past couple of semesters, and they're they're studying all about how books were made and used and their symbolism and what they need. And so a lot of times students will come and make their own paper and laser cut a um, uh, the binding for it, use all kinds of Fab Lab tools to create their own version of a book. Um, so this section right here, we're next to our 3D printers. This is where we've got our um, electronic station. So we've got all of these little soldering patties up here that um, a student designed and built on the laser cutter. Um, so you can just pull one of these out and it's got the iron and everything in there. You can wind the cord up around it. So sometimes we give our students um, design problems like this for something that we actually could use that's handy for us, but then also enhances their own skill set so that they're better able to help all the other learners who are coming in. So this definitely, I mean, it's a pretty simple design. It probably could have been zipped out really easily by a staff member, but instead we gave it to our student workers and said, when, they're, when the lab is slow, when there's downtime, we want you to design something to hold all of these little caddies to hold all of our soldering irons. And it took a heck of a lot longer um, and a lot of iterations, but that student then had mastered more of the design thinking skills as well as the fabrication skills, and we ended up with something handy that we could use. So there's lots of little touches like that, like the screen press that I pointed out earlier was also built by um, students. So we try to build their skill set when times are slow um, so that they're not sitting idle. Uh, and hopefully it's something that can benefit us too. Katie, can, um, I, can I interrupt oh. and ask a couple questions from the yeah. chat? This is Amy. I'm sorry, you're on a roll and I love it. I have so many questions about everything. I can't see the chat, so I'm glad you interrupted yes. me. Um, somebody asked about the brand of the heat press that you ended up purchasing. And I'm curious, um, since you're still kind of in that corner, if you could tell us yeah. what brand that the heat press was. That was one you did not make. You didn't I make didn't that one, right? No, we okay. didn't make it. I know we bought it from Heat Press Nation. Yep, and that's the brand of it too. I wasn't sure if that was just where we got it or if that was the brand. So Heat Press Nation. Um, and then here are the specifications for the ones that we, the one that we specifically got. Um, and I'm happy to email that out too. They had have, they have all different kinds. And then um, which brand of soldering iron have you bought that withstands the use? Sorry to make you walk back. I didn't oh, realize no, how much iron. further they were apart. Yeah, which soldering true. iron brand did you all end up getting that um, withstands like the constant student use? Oh, well, <laughs> I could tell you which brand we got. They haven't all held up very well. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how to say this. Echo? Echo? Um, I will say so we've had to replace quite a few. Um, I will say they're also not, our electronic station as a whole is not as heavily used as I think a lot of other maker spaces are. I think we've got a really big electrical engineering um, department on our campus. So you would think that maybe we had a lot of, would have a lot of use from that, but really um, they have their own well kitted out labs. And so a lot of those students are doing work over there. Um, and I think, I don't know other reasons why for non-electrical engineering majors, I don't know if they just, um, that 
electronic, they're fairly easy to and inexpensive to purchase. So some people who want to do soldering just get their own. But um, but those have held up fairly well. We've had them four years, and like I said, we've had to replace some. Um, but I also don't think they get as heavy use as other spaces. Thank you so much. Sorry for interrupting you. That's awesome. Oh, no, that's fine. Any other questions? I'll wait. The other ones are more broad, so we'll ask at the end. Yep. Awesome. Well, I'll flip it back around. Um, so, lots of students just studying. We do not have any stories, <laughs> so we don't have any closets. So we've got some um, desks like this that have lockable drawers, so we'll hide like our office supplies in there and other things. We just have our own staff offices, and then a small space in the back dock where we've got. Um, some storage space that we share with the rest of the libraries, but not a lot. Um, this area here is our sewing area, our textiles area. So this shelf, we've got a lot of donated fabric. So we have staff members in the library who will donate their scraps. We had an um, uh, interior design major who had an internship and they were getting rid of a ton of their swatches, uh, fabrics that they were no longer gonna carry. So she brought them all here and then people can stitch them together, use them as scraps, whatever they want to do with them. Um, so we've got a couple different sewing machines. This was the first one that we got and it's definitely not the most popular. It's a little more simple or maybe like a beginning sewing machine, but it can also jam up a little bit easier. Um, and then we've got a couple of these Janomis that are popular. Um, we have nope cat signs put out when things uh, go awry and we can't use those pieces of equipment. So we have sewing machines. We've got um, a couple of sergers for sewing hems. These two machines are dual sewing and embroidery machines. Um, so right now, this one's set up for sewing, but you can swap out and attach a frame here to do a small um, embroidery area. I don't remember how big this is, and I'm terrible at estimating measurements, but um, I think it's like three by four. Um, so they can do some embroidery there and we've used these for outreach um, as well. We can just pack them up in the car. And then the most popular is the big embroidery machine that we've got. So this is a Brother um, PR655 Entrepreneur is the brand that we've got. And it can do, it can do more than six colors, but it'll do six colors at a time and then it'll pause and you load up the next round of threads if your design has more than six colors and it just keeps going from there. Um, this machine itself has a couple of built-in designs that you can choose from, basically like simple monograms and frames and um, some small designs like that are kind of random, like a pizza and things that I don't know why people would want to embroider. But um, what we had to buy separately was the design software, um, which is called PE Design 10. So that's installed on this computer here, and that's what allows people to create their own files and import those to then embroider. So um, they can import a JPEG or um, an Illustrator file. And then we've got all of these different frame sizes. Um, and this, this one here is for baseball hats. Um, so that's been really fun. We have a, a race team on campus that builds their own race cars and they came in and like embroidered their headrests and then used the vinyl cutter to cut out their sponsor logos for their banners. Um, so I know that's something everybody loves is the creative ways people come up with using things that we never would have thought of ourselves. This area back here is where we have our glass kilns. So we've got a couple workshops that we do um, each week throughout the semester. Um, these kilns can do both glass and ceramics. Right now we have just focused on doing glass. But we've got this little baby one that we could take to do outreach events with, and then this big guy, and then this one is gonna be saved um, for the ceramics. But we can do things like, um, here's some examples. So before the holidays, we taught people glass fusing and they made snowflakes. Um, here's another, another snowflake there. Uh, there's powder printing, which is, I know this is probably copyrighted, but in the spirit of fair use. Um, so you first vinyl cut a stencil 
Um, so this person vinyl cut the Princess Leia, and then you lay that over the piece of glass and tap the powder through the holes of the stencil. So the powder is just sitting on the surface of the glass. And then when you fire it, it adheres to it and you can kind of feel a little bit of the texture, but it's not going anywhere. Um, and then the third one that we've done is kiln carving. So it is um, a piece of material like this that we laser cut that won't then burn in the kilns. So if you lay that piece on the bottom of the kiln, lay a flat sheet of glass on top of it, and then the glass will slump down into that hole. Um, so you can have little raised, I don't know if that's a good depiction of it, but you can kind of see how it's raised on the edge. So you've got this little octopus guy. Um, this is a Game of Thrones dire wolf. Um, and these are some eyeballs. There's a project management engineering course that's part of our maker literacies program. And their assignment each semester is to create um, a horse. Oh, and I think my coworker Morgan is bringing one out because he can hear me talking. So here are some of the horses. This is Morgan. <laughs> these are the horses. Um, so the students uh, made these eyeballs with the kilns. They screen printed the fabric onto, um, or screen printed the design onto the fabric. They, on this one, they used our shop room, which I'll show you all in a minute to make the um, hooves, horseshoes, that's the word I'm thinking of. Um, they 3D printed the stirrups and yeah, laser cut the leather, embroidered the saddle um, blanket. And then I think that's it, they sewed everything else. And then they made the corral in the shop room as well. So that class um, was a, like I said, it was project management engineering. Thanks, Morgan. Um, Morgan's our maker literacy, or our um, Fab Lab librarian who assists a lot with our maker literacy work. So he and me and Martin and our other coworker Gretchen do a lot of that work. But that class that did the horses, their project is project management and time management. So while they had to learn all of the pieces of equipment, they also had to, um, structure their time and realize which processes were going to take longer and assign costs to all of those um, timelines. And if they went over time, they'd go over budget. And um, so that was the real point of their course, but they got to learn all those things in a very creative way. Um, so I just walked into our shop room, um, which maybe I'll back out and give y'all the thousand eye view. So here's our entrance to the library, we swing past the bathrooms, and then we've got this big blast-in space, um, and that's our shop room, and then the kilns are over next to it. So the rest of the space is open about 90 hours a week. The shop room has much shorter hours because we want a full-time staff member to be in the space whenever it's accessible. Uh, and we have to do trainings on everything, whereas the rest of the space is kind of come up and talk to us and we'll get you started and we're there to oversee you. So um, we offer trainings for each piece of equipment as well as a general safety training um, and kind of have those on a two week cycle. And then people can just contact us if they need to get trained outside of those hours. Um, but we've got a table saw, we've got a shop bot router, um, this is what was primarily used to make the screen press. Um, all of the big pieces of wood were just designed um, as vector files and then cut out on here. We've got the plasma cutter, so those horseshoes were made on here. Um, it can cut through uh, all different kinds of metals. And then we've got traditional shop tools like um, compound miter saw, drill presses, band saws, scroll saws, all of that, sanders and grinders. Um, and then this, we're working on building a shelf to go under the rack that had all of the 3D printers on it so that we can store all of the 3D prints people make and other supplies and materials within these drawers. So they'll kind of be sectioned off and we number each box so that, and we use our um, system uh, called Fab App, which I can show you all in a minute to kind of gauge or to, to know, okay, this print is done. It's being assigned to this shelf space. 
now this person has come back in to pick it up let me swipe their ID okay now I know exactly which drawer their material is in um, so like I said this room shorter hours right now it's 2 to 8 p.m. Tuesday Wednesday Thursday and then we do all of the training times outside of those hours um, but sometimes people will contact us if they've got a special project and we accommodate them as best as we can um, so um, that is the general sweep of things. Uh, Amy, I can talk a little bit about Fab App or we can do questions. Yeah, I have a few. There's a few questions I want sure. to address if that's okay. And yeah, actually where you were standing just now and looking around, that's uh -huh. the first floor of a library. So that's the entrance. Yeah. People walk in yeah. the door and to the right is Einstein Bagels and then that's where you all are. So yeah. this is related to Sarah. Nagel's questions. So we're going to ask two questions at the same time. One, uh -huh. it's kind of like, how on earth did you get to remodel to turn into this amazing space in your library? And then how, what kind of remediation did you have to do in terms of, in terms of like your HVAC ventilation system? Can you talk oh. a little bit about what led to the creation? Because there's so much infrastructure that we're yeah. looking at here. Yeah. And let me see if Morgan's still in his office because he was, um, around more on the construction side of things when we were actually renovating the shop room. Um, but as far as the real estate itself, we're very fortunate that our Dean and Associate Dean of Libraries really wanted to have a big impactful makerspace in the library. So we were never in a position where we had to negotiate and kind of fight for space. When we first opened um, in 2014, it was just the little square area I'll walk back over there where we had um, the 3D printers and the laser cutter. So the back area that had all of the arts equipment, the staff offices, and then we just had a couple printers, a laser cutter, the vinyl cutter, um, and a handful of other tools. So kind of like this wall back here, this little square was where we first started out. Um, but then we hadn't been open very long before we were already planning for the expansion. So that negotiation was never, never a big issue for us. Um, as far as all the HVAC goes, gosh, the construction phase took a long time. And there were a lot of things where we thought, okay, we're done now. And then we'd go to install something and realize, oh, we don't have the right size outlet or the plasma cutter, you'll notice this big, um, the big hood that's above the cut plasma cutter itself, that kind of um, trapezoid shaped vent. So originally that was there, but had a much smaller plate under it to suction all the air up. This is not a good view at all. So this little smaller square was a lot smaller. And then we had to work so much with EHS where they would come back over and inspect. We'd show them, here's how we've been using it. It's working fine. They'd say, that's great, but we don't care. We still need you to do X, Y, Z. So there were lots and lots of little add-ons and changes. I'm um, laughing over here because we have a great relationship with our EHS folks and they're so gentle about the way they say no, but I really appreciate yeah. them. They're awesome. Yeah. And we've gotten to a place, I think they were very, shocked and a little unsure of what to do with us because we have this space in a library and they couldn't wrap their heads around the fact that like no this is open for everybody it's not just for the upper level students or the engineering students and yes it is right across from Einstein bagels but we're not doing anything um, that's creating sawdust outside of the shop room or anything that's going to impact the food quality or sanitation or production so there was some little freak outs about our existence, I think. Uh, but then once they wrapped their head around what we were trying to do and realized like we are trying to work with y'all, we're not trying to slide something past you, then um, they were, they've been great partners with us. So that leads to another question that, and, um, how are you all funded? Are you funded out of the library account or is it a multi, uh, I know our budget comes from multiple sources, but it's predominantly the library. I'm curious if you can tell us, especially since yeah. some of the folks watching this um, are in the just beginner stages of mm -hmm. creations of a makerspace, if you can talk about how your budget um, changed and grew over time, that'd be great. 
Yeah, so we are also primarily funded out of the, um, the just the library's general budget. Um, a lot of our, uh, like our facility costs, like the lights and the power, that I don't think those have ever even come to the library itself, but our staffing costs and the equipment costs and consumables, pretty much all of it is just from the library's budget. We have gotten some grants, so we got a grant for um, all of our electronics equipment, um, like our maker literacy work, but that's not directly funding staff or equipment. Um, we recoup costs through charging for the consumables. There is a lot that people can just bring in, like laser cutters. We're not recouping any costs for any of that because people are either using scraps or they're bringing in their own materials. Um, for the 3D printers, those are fairly self-sustainable because the actual cost of filament is not five cents a gram. We've just kind of bumped it to five cents and told people like, yes, this is more than the filament itself, but we're not making a profit off of it. This is just covering the bed tape and the replacement nozzles and all of the other wear and tear on the equipment. Um, but yeah, mostly uh, that's maybe not the, the best answer for you, but there's just a few grants and what we get back from consumables. We do charge some for outreach, not all of our outreach, but some K-12 groups that come through if they're not affiliated with the UTA program, we'll kind of charge a, a head count for those to um, recoup our staff's time and things like that, but mostly it's just our library budget. I just recently got a question via email about what we charge for the K-12 through and um, I, had, I haven't figured that out yet. So um, maybe later on, because there's other people that have questions, let's come back to that about how you charge for places. But yeah. one of the earlier questions is if you could talk to the, and I know you can because you do this with your grant, the curricular uses from your experience. So I think what Eric is asking is um, unique curricular uses beyond what you've mentioned already. Yeah, so we've done, um, We've done a lot of outreach to um, English classes. I haven't talked much about those. So we have had technical writing classes um, and there's a couple different assignments that technical writing has done. First they came in and their task was to learn some of the easier pieces of equipment and then write a digestible quick user guide for all the other learners coming into the space. So we have the manuals, but no one wants to read the manual. You just want to read a, a two page document that just has the very basics of how to get started. Um, so that was their assignment to kind of understand the tools, think through how to break it down into the most essential steps, um, and create guides that we could use based off of that. So it was very much a service learning project. Um, we have also had um, technical writing students where they had to come and design a product and then um, and then what they were writing for the English portion of it was like their pitch and they were using rhetoric to convey why their product that they created is the best and then they had a design competition at the end um, or a pitch competition I guess where they were showing off what they had made what they learned from it why it was a good product to use and then everybody was judged and they um, <clears throat> they had a like a winning product um, there's also been creative writing projects. Um, so the one that sticks out to me the most was just um, having the students come in to make, um, make an object that represented their character that they were writing about. So in order to make them not flat characters, three-dimensional three characters, um, they had to think about who this person is and what represents them and what are objects that they might have with them or something that symbolizes them. And so they had to come and actually fabricate that thing before they started writing. Um, so that was a fun one. We also have um, a Maker Literacies website that we're still, it's a very, it's a brand new website and we're still uploading a lot of content to it, but the um, intent of that site is to include uh, all of the assignments and curricula that have, um, from classes that have participated in Maker Literacies, both at UTA and all of our partner sites, so Boise State and UNR and um, uh, North Carolina, that they would all, UNC, that they would all um, upload their content so that, uh, yeah, and we just shared the link. I can see the chat now. So, um, so y'all can check that out too for more details than what I'm conveying well right now about each of the classes that we've done. 
can you talk, this question comes from John Burke at Miami, Miami University. Can you talk a little bit about your CNC machines? I don't know um, if you have any desktop ones. I don't think you mentioned that, but what kind do you have and how do they yeah. get used? Yeah, so we do have one um, desktop, or I guess two technically, um, little mills. Let me flip this camera around. So we have this Roland mill um, that I glossed over in the tour because it doesn't get used that much, and I forget that it's here. Um, so people have used this to make circuit boards. Um, now we have a PCB mill um, that was donated to us, so that gets a lot more use. But we kind of put this one over here next to the kilns so that eventually we can start teaching workshops on how to create molds out of this machine, uh, milling out the molds using this, and then you could cast the wax into it on the kilns. Um, wow, that's, that's far, awesome. It's not been the most popular. Um, oh, I also forgot about our 3D scanning stand. I always forget about him, but that's here in the middle. Um, it's nothing fancy, and we hope to kind of revamp it. Um, but we've got this dark box so that there's speed and light distribution. And then we've got a couple different scanners that we lock up in this cabinet down here that people can use. Um, handheld ones and then higher res ones. But as far as the CNC, there's the, um, the mill, there's the um, PCB mill, which people now, if they're wanting to do circuit boards, are just using that. But um, really, I mean, the, the 3D printers and the, laser cutter embroidery machine those are all cnc as well and those are the most popular tools um, that we have we teach a lot of illustrator sessions because once people know illustrator they can come in and use the laser cutters the vinyl cutting if they know vinyl cutting then they can do screen printing and vinyl printing vinyl um, transfer and they can use the embroidery machine as well so that illustrator is really a good gateway to so many of our tools. Katie, you just pointed out that some of the things are kept in the kind of, it looks like custom made furniture that's underneath the equipment that you're yeah. using it with. And I'm wondering if the space is open more hours than it's staffed. And if so, how, how accessible are these pieces of equipment when there is no staffing available? Yeah, so our hours, the, the central library where we're located is open 24 seven. So we have shorter hours during um, the summer, but the rest of the time the whole library is open and doesn't close at all unless there's a holiday. Um, so the Fab Lab hours, we open till midnight, Monday through Thursday, uh, or Sunday through Thursday, and then till 8 p.m. Friday, Saturday. So when we're closed, we have these gates here. I'll back out so you can kind of see um, but they're just kind of on the sides of these columns and we'll pull them closed so that we can close off this space here and then this space here. So this little area where we've got the lasers and the 3D printers um, and all of the, the printmaking materials are locked up when we're closed. And then for the sewing area, um, we have little hooks on the plugs. So these so when somebody wants to use one we come and unlock it and plug it in that way we can create a ticket for them in our system that we call fab app and that's wow. back all of their um all of their information like it's all de-identified so we're not saying katie came in on this day and made this 3d print but we can look at aggregate data we can look at traffic patterns we can see which majors have used the space more than others um so both for the safety of the equipment and the learners, we have the equipment um, either locked behind the gates over here, or we've got the locks on the plugs or this cabinet that's locked. So the equipment's not accessible if the lab is closed, but then the whole rest of the space, all of the tables and outlets and computers are still accessible to everybody. I'm looking up this. Um, I don't know why I've never considered this simple solution um, of locking the it power. Took us here. I don't know what made us think to do that. We're like, isn't there just some kind of lock we can put on the plug because we're not going to install more gates? And then there was such a thing. We I just, just got them off Amazon. I just put the link in the chat. Um, awesome. 
this is amazing and obviously we're generating a ton more questions than we probably have time for but what two people have asked about um if you can tell us about the fab app yeah let me get to a computer and thank you so much katie for doing this this is like um you all have done such a great job developing your space thank it's you just so amazing to you're aspirational for many of us um, oh i appreciate that um so here's fab app quickly and and you won't if you go to fabapp.uta.edu um you won't see all of this back end but you will see the front end so oops that's our website um so when you log in, you can see um, we've got a wait list for the vinyl cutter. Do you need this computer? Okay, good. Um, we've got um, so a wait list for the boss laser, so people can come in and they swipe their card if, if that machine is in use. And we, we can send them a notification to their email or their phone whenever that piece of equipment is ready for them. And then they've got a short window of time to show up or it'll move on to the next person. But then you can see everything else that is um every other piece of equipment that we have the little green dot means that it's in good working order yellow means that we're having some issues with it but it's still operational and then the red x means that it's down for maintenance um and then if somebody's actually using it it shows you that we've got a ticket number and a start time and an end time so like poly printer 2 it says movable because that print is done so when we start a print, it creates a ticket. We have folks write down, um, were there any potential problems? Circle yes or no. So, you know, if a learner comes in and is adamant that they don't want to print something with support, or I know my file has a bunch of errors, I don't care, I want to print it anyway. Then we can say, yes, we see potential problems. And the learner then has to, the learner and the staff member who helped them have to sign off. And then this, I cannot read it, but this is the details of, uh, something about the print. So we could say chose not to print without support. So that way when somebody comes back in, if their print failed, we have record and are able to say like, well, we show that we did advise you to print with support. So because you chose to forgo that and the print failed, you are still responsible for um, paying for the materials that you used from us. Um, but once FabHub says movable, we can click around in there. Let me pull that back up. Um, so we could click end if we wanted to, and it brings up information about like, okay, Poly Printer 2, this is the ID number for the student who was using it, their ticket number, the timestamp. Then we can put in, we weigh it so that we know exactly how many grams it was. This is the estimate that's generated by his slicer. Um, and we would say move to storage or failed if it failed. If they're standing there and want to pick it up, it's just pick up now. Um, you can leave notes and then it'll tell you which place in this cabinet to store it. And so this is what that shelf in the shop room will replace this shelf here. But we've got them all gridded out and then somebody will swipe, swipe their card, pull it up and it says, oh, your print is on 1D, uh, then this is that person's print. And we have their receipt under it so we can check to make sure that's really them and then um, finish the checkout process, charging them and all of that. Um, so this allows us to uh, create tickets, like I said, we can track where prints are going since those are the things that take the longest. Um, you can go back in and click look up ticket if someone has a job and they, you know, they're, uh, they're coming to pick it up that we can look it up by their ticket number or I, their ID. Um, our service maintenance log. These are all of all of our equipment issues that we've got going on at the moment. But just a few things that are just completely not operational. Um, and then it has the wait queue that I was talking about earlier, where you can put in which piece of equipment that that person is wanting to use, their ID number, their contact information, um, and then we can send them alerts when it's their turn to use the equipment. So that is all open source. If any of y'all know coding and are up to the task of adapting it for yourself, it's on our GitHub, um, which I can send the link to. I can never remember URLs off the top of my head, but um, that is- It's already in the chat. 
<laughs> Someone already found it and put oh, it in the yeah. chat. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting you. No, no, no. That's totally fine. Katie, that's so we, amazing. Um, we want people to use it. We know it's kind of involved. Um, I would not be able to help tell you what to change about the code to adapt it. <laughs> but if you know somebody who could do that, we, we want it to be useful for others. Can we... Um, can we ask, can we, do you have time for one more question? Can we ask about the outreach? Great. So you talked a lot about taking specific pieces of equipment on the road. And then um, can we go back to that question about K through 12? How do you decide what you're going to charge? And how do you charge oh, based yeah. on headcount? And then can you tell us about how you've defined how you do outreach programs? I think mm -hmm. for us, because I'm in an isolated region, we do get a lot of requests for outreach. and um, I will at some point develop something more strategic, but we base it right now just based on our available resources. And I'm curious yeah. if you could talk a little bit more about how you charge, when you charge, and what your outreach looks like. Yeah, um, so right now the charges that we have are um, $15 a person for an hour and a half of instruction. Um, so that would cover the cost of the staff time as well as the materials that would be involved in making their project. What's really difficult for us is that a lot of times entire grades are wanting to come to the lab at a time. Like they're done with their state testing and they want to bring all 80 people in their class for, for a field trip. And that we just don't have, we don't have the physical space. I know we have a large space, but um, we couldn't continue our regular operations and accommodate that many people at a time. So oftentimes what ends up happening is if they don't have the money or the time to do an hour and a half of instruction which is really the very smallest amount of time that I can that we can actually complete an activity and if they're really learning how to do something and not just slapping some things together you need a little bit of time and that's um, hard to come by uh, for both for us and for the schools but oftentimes what ends up happening is the groups will just come for a tour and we try to make it as interactive as we can I think there's actually, yep, there's one coming now. Um, so this group that's queuing up here outside the entrance, we charge 250 a person for a one hour tour. We walk them through the space that I just showed y'all, but we've got demos going on all of the pieces of equipment because they don't know what a laser cutter is. And so we have, have the machines running so that they can tell what's going on. and um, and then we have some sort of little giveaway at the end, like a vinyl cut sticker of the Fab Lab logo or a little 3D printed keychain to make it kind of worth their, worth their money to have come out. Um, but there's not a lot of activities that we can do with more than 15 students at a time. And for Texas, at least, there's not a lot of classes that have numbers that small. Um, so that's pretty tricky. And so that's if they're coming out to us. Sometimes we'll waive the cost if they're like a Title I school um, or have some other need base or we'll reduce the cost by half because um, we want students who wouldn't traditionally be able to be exposed to this equipment to be able to see it. So we kind of just do those on a case-by-case -case basis. And then we will go out to schools and libraries. We do a lot of less of that than we used to just because we have so many other initiatives going on here in-house and our space is so much bigger. When I first started, and it's been about four years, but when I first started, we did outreach all the time. There was something once a week, or if not that, then every other week we were going someplace to kind of evangelize, I guess, about the Fab Lab. Um, but right now, the Fab Lab is mostly just, it's only open to students, faculty, and staff. Um, we do the K-12 outreach where they're paying to come in, but it didn't make sense for us to keep doing tabling events and um, other outreach to the community just for us to say, one day we're gonna have community access again. It's just not yet. So we've kind of held off on that until we get our community membership model in place, which is something we've been working on. And then people who aren't affiliated with UTA can pay a monthly membership fee um, to get a card and be able to use everything in the space too. So that's what we're working towards just so that it's far less labor on our end and yet we're still able to provide access. Um, and then it kind of equalizes, like doesn't matter if you're a student, faculty, staff, community member, everything's just first come first serve instead of us having to kind of 
divide our attentions more or less. That's amazing and super helpful. I've taken a lot of notes so that I have more things. That's uh, community membership is something we had looked at a while back and it ultimately re uh, resulted in spurring others to action and multiple people created businesses for the community. So now when we first started talking about that, we were the only makerspace around and now there are three other makerspaces in Boise that yeah. can meet that demand. And so we just refer them all there, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. We just had our um, our public library, Arlington Public Library, just opened a brand new um, downtown branch that's huge and beautiful, and they put a makerspace in there. Um, so we partnered with them initially to help get them to get their staff trained on all the equipment and get it off and running when it first opened. But now, if people are just wanting to come and 3D print or so or do anything that involves the equipment that they have, we can just point them down the road instead of feeling really guilty. <laughs> and there are a couple other spaces that are local too that weren't here a few years ago. That's amazing. Um, it's 11.52 and in the spirit of everybody's time, I want to yeah. ask if you have other things you wanted to share with us. There's no other questions coming in. So if anyone who's listening has a question, go ahead and type it in. Um, type it in now so that we have a couple minutes to get to it. But is there anything you want to share with us? Um. I can't think of anything other than what I've already shared. I'm sure I will in five minutes once we get off the call. But I will say that um, we're happy to share any resources that we do have or, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say give advice, but if, if anybody wants to pick our brains about what we've done, um, we're, always, <clears throat> we're always happy to do that. And you can either email me directly. <coughs> Excuse me. My email's... Um, K-A-P-E-E-R-Y at uta.edu, or you can email fablab at uta.edu, and I'll get it, and we can set up a conference call or whatever would be helpful. There is one more question that popped in. I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste your email address and put it in here, but it says, what kind of training requirements for equipment use and staffing models do you have? So I think it's... Yeah. You know how to answer. You know what that's like. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So when we hire new staff, we try to hire the students in cohorts so that we've got a couple of them at a time. And then we have evolved our training model several times over the years. But what's really working well for us now is we have two hour blocks of time for pretty much every piece of equipment and every piece of software. Every, every piece of software sometimes the equipment and the software are tied so we'll group them in cohorts and find common times when everyone's available um or at least four or five of them are available and then we'll say okay this this is the training where you're learning 3d modeling then we have a different training for 3d slicing and printing so they're used learning the hardware side of things then they learn illustrator then they go and do the epilogue laser and the boss laser cutter so it's very intense and involved but Every other method that we've used um, has resulted in us later than trying to backtrack and say like, oh, no, well, I mean, I guess we didn't really tell you, but we don't want you to do X, Y, Z. So it has, for us, worked well and paid out to just be um, more thorough up front than to try and backtrack. So we pay the students for their training time. When they're new, they are kind of splitting their time. They're either shadowing in the lab or they're in training. So if they're not in a training, they are not like essential to be on staff. We are still fully staffed without them there, but their job is just to walk around and learn what the heck they need to do. Um, and then we give them assignments for each area, for each training that we've done. So after the training, they then have to apply what they just learned to make an object. Um, and then we have critiques, uh, two different critiques. So after the first wave of equipment, we'll have everybody come together. They're presenting their final projects. And then everyone's discussing them openly. Like, here's what worked really well. Here's what you might want to change next time. So it's not like a, a pass-fail type thing. It's just uh, we're all here to improve all of our skills. We're all coming in with different backgrounds and areas of expertise. And for us, we've tried to really hire from all over campus. So we don't just have engineering and art majors. We've got business majors and nursing majors. And sometimes we hire somebody because they've got a great personality and customer service skills and the willingness to learn and we know that they'll catch on to the equipment quickly but they don't necessarily come in already knowing any of the equipment so that's another reason why we have to be so thorough and other spaces are more efficient in other ways like just hiring people who already know a lot of the tools. 
Katie, would you be willing to share any of your training modules yeah. with us that you have? Because that's, I've developed a lot of mine and maybe that's something for like a future, that could be an article on its own, yeah. right? Or, or like a book, how do you train your student employees yeah. in higher ed <laughs> makerspaces? Because I feel like that's a lot of what I've been doing the past yeah. year is trying to figure out how to, and what I have found is that hiring in cohorts does work and then also um, you have to constantly reset the culture so that the culture yeah. continues to be in line with what we need and open to everyone. So if you have anything you, sh you can share with us, I'll, yeah. I can pass it around to the group. If that's For sure. We don't have any of it on our website, so I'll, I'll scrounge it up and send it out. We're, we're wanting to add it to the website because, you know, everything we're making, we just want to share it openly, but we wanted to make it pretty first, so <laughs> we haven't formatted everything, but I can still send, like, the content is still there even if it doesn't look great. Have you, that's awesome. Have you published on any of this that is anything we can look up in the meanwhile? We published a paper, uh, Morgan, who brought the horses out, he and I published a, page, a paper last year for ISAM that was about our student hiring process, and it okay. touched on our training process, um, but it didn't go in-depth into that, and then we are going to, um, we've revamped it since then, so we do have plans to, um, uh, we're writing a book chapter that's do sometime this semester I can't remember when but it'll be about our student hiring and training process awesome yeah. okay yeah sharing anything you can share we have so much to learn and I feel so thankful for you today that you were able to give us an hour of your time to show us around your space for many of us this is something that um, growing into a space that size is just a pipe dream at this time so I really appreciate I you. Live it, but <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of thank yous. Um, there's one question: What would you like to add to your lab next? Maybe that can be our final. Can you answer that? Like, in, yeah, yeah. Um, so we have talked about how we have so much equipment and it's so hard to train everybody on it. So what we actually would love to do next is some further construction to kind of maybe expand the footprint of the shop room and to um, build out the spaces a little bit better. Some of them are kind of crammed and squished um, and they aren't as conducive for tours and instruction. Um, so we have a laundry list of tools that we would want, like a water jet cutter and um, a vinyl printer and cutter so that you can design your own printer, uh, stickers and print them as well as cut them out. So those awesome. are stuff that we would love to have. Um, but I think before we keep adding equipment, we need to make sure the space can actually accommodate more of it. So hopefully we'll get some funding to do that. Well, that's amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah, of course. Our next tour is going to be the first Monday in March, and it's going to be with the University of Cincinnati. Um, pay attention. We'll send out some emails about that. Um, there's a huge round of applause for you in the chat. I just wanted to echo that to you, Katie. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a real delight, and I learned so much from you. So, thank you um, so much.